The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com. Hello and welcome back to the Ben Heck Show. So Ben, last week we started work on the mini pinball game. This week we're gonna continue working on the mini pinball game. That's right. I'm going to continue to rebuild the flipper mechs so we can get a good idea of how they can work with the smaller solenoids. And then also in the background, Felix is going to be working on the Teensy 3.1, which is a pretty popular microcontroller that's based off a Freescale system on a chip. And what he's gonna do with that is try to get the DAC working, the digital analog converter, so we can use it to play music and sound effects. Sounds like we've got a lot of work to do. Let's get flipping. Amazing hacks. Should we take it for a spin? Inspired designs. Imhotep's priests. Regrettable acting. No one seems to get it. Each week, Element 14's The Ben Heck Show brings you innovative projects using electronics, engineering, and more. This just in, the Teensy 3.6. We have it, it has a SD card slot on it, really cool. It's got a DAC, it's got uh, DAC zero and DAC one. So what I intend to do is uh, put it on this board. Well, I had done some tests earlier and I made this smaller board and this smaller board, I just had the MOSFETs and some buttons to trigger the solenoids. Now I just kind of glued that onto this larger board, put some headers on here to mount the Teensy 3.6 and I connected the an audio jack to the DAC a couple other things I'm going to do uh, set up on this board is I've got two outputs for the solenoid. I'm going to add, uh, I suppose I'll add two more MOSFETs so we can have a total of four solenoids. We probably won't need that many. I think I'll add some headers for three buttons. Additionally, I will add a header for servo. Uh, another thing about the, the Teensy, it's a 3.3 volt logic. The board has a three volt regulator on it. I have this, this rig here. So the battery is coming into a regulator and the five volts is going to the, the Teensy, but then from the Teensy, I have three volts coming over to this little board that I glued on here for the logic. So there's 16 volts in this battery when it's fully charged and it comes in this regulator, knocks it down to five, and then I have the switch here to separate the uh, five volt from the uh, Teensy, and that's for programming purposes. But the first thing I'm gonna do is get the, uh, the DAC working. All right, Felix has the MOSFETs. He's working on a circuit right now. So I'm just hooked this directly up to a power supply. Let's see if it's any different. Oh yeah, look at that. See if we can go like, because before we were having trouble going up the middle. Oh look, nice backhand. Whoa. Yeah, pretty good action. All right, I'm going to build the other flipper and then I'll make a case at the right angle and then we'll hook it up to what Felix is making. I'm still working on getting the DAC uh, to function and I'm having troubles with the SD card reading. In the meantime, Ben's got a nice little mock-up over there. So I'm gonna pass this on over to him. I got the buttons hooked up and then some outputs for the uh, solenoids. And I put some potentiometers on here so we can change the duty cycle. Oh, okay, so you're PWMing it. So as far as the PWM is concerned, we probably would wanna have a full burst when you push the button, like so it has enough power to get up. But then once it's up, we'll count like, I don't know, a 10th of a second and then we'll switch to a PWM. Okay. Do you have the uh, 12 volts going to this cable here. I mean, can we hook the solenoids up to this? Mm -hmm. Why don't we just uh, test it right here? Let's get inspiring. I think we should get inspiring, Felix. The thing is we don't want it to like fall down. See that? Yeah. Now go to the, adjust the right pot and lower it. Way, go far, way, 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 keep going, keep going. Okay, now it's like really wimpy. Okay, so let's say there's a full pulse that makes it go high and then we hold it. Here, can you also push the button? Sure. Okay. See, all it has to do here is prevent the ball from pushing it back down. Okay, release it. 
So we do a tenth of a second. It probably wouldn't even take that. I and mean, we could, you could probably do like five milliseconds of full force. Mm -hmm. Or we could do like a high, we could just do a high PWM and then switch the PWM. So we could just do a software timer. So let's do this. Let's, uh, let's do a left test. All right, get on the pot. There we go. Keep going down. Go down to like 25. So there's not enough force to get it up, but there is enough force to hold it up. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's uh, adjust the left flipper. I want to get on the pot. Yeah. Let's see how much it takes to make it move. Up, up, up. Starting at 70, okay, so let's write down 70% as the threshold. I don't think it's gonna move that great at 70. It's gonna be like, I'm 70 years old. Okay, all right, let's keep going up with it. Ready? Going up, keep going up. 90's got some snap. Okay, yeah, let's get them both up to 90. Yeah, 87's close enough. Man, this is a riveting game. Yeah. All right, I think we need to go a little bit above 90. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna adjust the code. If button state left equals one, which means it's pressed, correct? Oh, so you did it active high, not active low. All right, so every, every time you push the button, the timer is gonna increment. If the timer is less than five cycles, then we'll do a higher PWM. Else, if it's more than five cycles, we'll do a lower PWM. How about we do this? We'll, uh, we'll just do this one to like, oh hell, 100. Else, we'll do the lower setting, which we have set via the potentiometer. So why don't you, uh, what, what do you say, 25 or maybe 35 to be safe? Why don't you dial those both down to 35 while I do this? Stop. Okay, go. Okay, for some reason we're not getting the high state that we want. All right, switch me back into programming mode, please. Programming. Is it actually programming? I wonder if it's... Oh, wait. Oh, oh God. <laughs> I put 100 instead of 255. Ah, so dumb. A bit of chip. Gone. All right, well, let's go back into programming mode. We'll figure this out. Programming. Oh. Yeah. So what... What are, you, what are you doing? Is it? Is it uh, it's just changing? a. It's no. It's just a really fast microcontroller. We were doing so few cycles of high current that it didn't even matter because of the speed. Well, actually, you know what we could do? Do you have any other I/O that you could use off the top of your head? Can we hook up a LED really quick just to be cheap and dirty? Uh, yeah. I want to see what its actual frequency is. Uh, yeah. So let's just uh, find a random pin that we can. Any oh. pin? Yeah, I just want to blink an LED. So right. we, we blink the LED at full kernel speed, then we can take that, divide it by two, and figure out what the actual frequency is with interpretation and uh, wiring. Let's do this. Let's see how fast it is, how fast it actually is. Because when you write things in C, it's different, especially if you use this Arduino stuff. Like if you type digital write 13 and you try to just toggle a pin, it's going to do so many things under the hood to be compatible over the 96 billion Arduino boards that are out there. So let's do digital write 13, write timer plus plus. So we're just going to increment that timer. So that'll give us 010101 every time there's a kernel loop. And then we can test that frequency and divide by, you no, know, multiply by two. And then we'll know actually how fast this kernel is running. So before I do that, I should put in the rest of the logic. Okay, if button state left equals one, left timer plus equals one, left timer is less than 10, turn on full power, else turn on lower power, else turn everything off. So what we can do is we can pulse that LED, look at it on the scope to find out how fast this is actually running. Then we can use that to divide up the actual values that we need. Let me just get all this right button stuff in place. I want to do this because I want to know, you know, how long this is actually going to take. Okay, there we go. So the LED, well, it looks like it's solid on, but it's actually flashing. So this is what scopes are good for. They show you what's actually going on. That doesn't seem that fast. 241 hertz. Well, it is doing some analog measurements. Those can slow things down. Let's remove those and see what happens. Yeah, it's sped up. See that? Well, this is a good example of just how much time analog readings can take. When you do an analog reading, it uh, sets a timer and then it waits a certain amount of time for the voltage to change. So basically it's not instantaneous. That still seems slow. Yeah, see how they're wider there at the front? Of course, you can also see debounce, which we're not accounting for right there. So you have some, 
Oh yeah, there's not that many white pulses. I'll look at, we only have like maybe three pulses. That's not good. So there, there's debounce noise from the switch. So when the switch is debouncing, that means it's not quite open, not quite closed, so you can see it on the scope. And then we have only a few cycles of solid power and then we go into the hold power. Yeah, so blinking that LED to try to figure out the frequency I think is giving us an inaccurate rating. Because if we look at this, this is 488 uh, hertz for the PWM, and then we have only about three cycles. So that's uh, a very, very small amount. All right, so I'm just gonna have to keep shotgunning these numbers. Reprogramming. Oh, it's starting to move. Blit, 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 blit. Oh, you can see it there. There's the, here's the shoddy debounce right there. That's pretty gross, actually. The switch is pretty dirty. All right, so we have to get the high pulse signal wider in order for the flipper to make it all the way up. We'll find out whatever the minimum distance is to make the flipper go up, and then we'll double it. And then that's what we'll use. At 2,000 kernel cycles, it looks like the flippers have enough power. But what if they don't? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is actually kind of fun. This is like super advanced flipper technique. We started out with just the flipper and then we reduced its angle. Originally it was like 35 degrees. So I cut that down to about 20, just so it's a little easier. And then here are the parts coming off of it. So we have the flipper, and we have the thing that holds the flipper in the six millimeter wood right there. And we have an actuator below that. And I've changed the hex pattern a little bit. See how the hex pattern is rotated down about 15 degrees? Uh, that will make sure the flipper can only be installed the right way on the rod. There's a linkage coming off of that. Now on the last test we did, I actually rotated the actuator, which is the purple part here, backwards. But in this test, I want the actuator to stay straight. So I rotated the hexagonal hole, and then I rotated the linkage 15 degrees. And that means the rod and the solenoid will also be offset at 15 degrees. There's the rod, and there's the solenoid. I still have to draw the solenoid bracket, uh, but that gives you a pretty good idea of where it's all gonna end up. See, what I think I could do is possibly combine this and this into one piece. That way, when you put it together, the solenoid will be automatically at the right distance and position relative to the rotational point of the flipper. I'm gonna go in, I'm gonna connect this part here with something to hold the solenoid, so that's one solid part, and then we can reassemble and retest. Hey, that, that works pretty well, even with the sloppy tolerance. Something else we could do here, we could have this bent piece of metal come back over and then have it uh, act as a pivot point for that. I think what I'll do is I'll print the next pair with slightly closer tolerance. Of course, you know, one thing, I didn't reprint this. So actually the tolerance may be right, it's just the fact that this one was at a different tolerance. Yeah, maybe I should do that just to be doubly sure. Cause yeah, I had it pretty close before. Okay, it's got some misalignments, but it's pretty close now. I'm gonna secure it with some hot glue. So I made a mark on the uh, shaft here at 1.15 inches. So I cut this and brought it in. I think I can parametrically fix that in the file. All right, we're gonna grab the power supply and make sure this still works. There we go. You don't have to make that sound, but it helps. Well, right now I'm still trying to uh, get the audio coming out of the deck. Just trying to get that all sorted out. So far what I've done is um, I've managed to get a sine wave to play. So here in the code, call these libraries audio, wire, SD, SPI, and bounce. I know that I'm going to need SD. Some of the problems that I've been coming up with here is that the TNC 3.6 is still a little bit new. It's been around since uh, about October, but um, I've been going through all of the PJRC uh, on the forum there, and I found a bunch of posts with with regard to getting audio coming out of the deck on the TNC 3.6 via reading wave files off the, S the onboard SD card. The onboard SD interface is a little bit different than the breakout, and uh, the library has uh, some issues with supporting that, but I think it should be mature enough by now, and I've also seen a couple of um, other tutorials where people have managed to do it successfully. However, I think they've used other SD libraries. I gotta figure out which SD library works and how I need to tweak it in a particular way in 
order to be able to properly read the WAV files off the SD card in order to play them through the deck. However, yeah, I've managed to get a sine wave to play. I've also added the uh, debounce library, or bounce library. I've defined flipper left, right, and I've also added a start button. We have the analog, the potentiometers here. We have our flipper buttons. We, we define our buttons in the bounce library there. And then the potentiometers. Now here's some issues that I'm coming up with the SD card. I've got this in here so far, but it, that's still a work in progress. But with regard to the waveform here, this is how the audio is set up. There's two pins for the DAC, zero and a one. I haven't been able to get both of them to play. I've only been able to get one of them to play. Well, I make the uh, audio synth waveform object, the audio play. So, oh, actually this uh, play sound wave, that's, that's the object that's gonna uh, read off the SD card and send it through the deck. That's the one I, ha I still have yet to work on, but the audio output analog, DAC1, that's the object. For one of the DAC pins, I connect waveform through the patch cord to the audio connection of uh, analog output. See, DAC1, waveform, DAC1, through the patch cord. And in the setup, I have some serial output going. Let's see here, let's reset this, and let's say upload. It's taking some time here to upload. So I just uploaded that so you can see what's going on here with the serial. And it's just printing out the version. Here we go. Pinball version uh, 2. I took off the pull-down resistors and set the internal pull-ups. We need to update the buttons. So we have button flipper left, button flipper right, and button start. We update those to get the current state. And then here we go with the audio. Audio setup, audio memory, and uh, waveform 1. It'll begin the sine wave. And as you can see here, uh, read the SD card. There's things to do there yet. So here's a function called check buttons. Let's go to the main loop. And the main loop all there is is check buttons. So basically what check buttons does is it goes through the loop and at the beginning of the loop it uh, updates the three buttons. If button flipper left is falling edge it'll say press. That's actually the right one. Okay so button flipper right press and then release it says release. The same with the left and right do the same. With the start button I've added the waveform. So if button start falling edge, well, the button hasn't been updated, it'll do something. It'll play the waveform at frequency 440, and then at an amplitude of 0.9, and it'll just print out a dot, as you can see here. I let it go, it releases, and it stops the, uh, the audio. So there's the, it sets it back, sets the amplitude back to zero, and then we go, we continue through the loop again. So as you can see on the, uh, Oscilloscope, there's our waveform. All right. So what I need to do is uh, be able to trigger an audio file to properly read off the SD card and play it through the, um, the deck. And I just want to trigger that with a button. Instead of a, a sine wave, it'll be an audio file. So that's what I need to focus on next. Ben, the mini pinball kit's looking pretty good. If there's anything you would like to see in our mini pinball kit, tell us about it on the Element 14 community on element14.com forward slash TVHS. You can also go there to read about other upcoming episodes, builds, and special events. We'll see you next time. I burped. <laughs> <laughs> it's time to get continued. <laughs> it's time to get continued. <laughs> I sound like Lou Armstrong, but I'm not. I'm Timesy, the multiplication sprite. No, no multiplication. multiplication. So, you want to program in assembly language, huh? No multiplication! You're just gonna have to add things over and over! Many times. Yeah, I mean, it's not an argument, because Karen's wrong, and I'm right. He was a dorky kid, getting beaten up by bullies, till he found a magic book, and opened to page three. <laughs> He's a math lord, math lord, doing math and solving crimes. Oh, all the tables could be made out of the New York Times, so they're times tables. <laughs> You are the new math lord! What do you think about this uh, math idea? Oh, uh, sounds, it sounds like something to do, I guess. <laughs> oh, there's gonna be like some terrible like animated puppet thing that's like his best friend, like <laughs> Apparently you do not have Kevin Spacey-like reflexes. No, I don't. Call of Duty cycle. <laughs> The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com.